Mm -hmm. drunk. Hello, thanks for watching part two of Good Games in Unexpected Places. First, I want to clarify the title, because some people think that by unexpected places, I'm saying that the platform the game is on sucks. That may be the case with something like Virtual Boy or the Apple Pippin, where you can find cool stuff like Virtual Boy Wario Land and Super Marathon, respectively. But no, if I'm talking about something on the Sega Master System or TurboGrafx-16, for example, I'm not saying those platforms suck or anything like that. It's really just an excuse to start digging into some more platforms in addition to what I usually cover on this channel, and finding certain ports or even original games that you may not expect to find otherwise that are still worth playing today. A good example of this is Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. Now, the N64 isn't exactly known for role-playing games. I mean, how many RPGs are even on that system? Like, six? And how many are actually good? But then here we are, out of nowhere, with a freaking Ogre Battle game on the system, a semi-real-time tactics-oriented RPG, and it's really freaking good. This is a sequel to Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together, but the gameplay is a lot closer to the game before that, March of the Black Queen. So if you like how the battles are structured in that game, then you'll really dig this game. The combat is all about managing your troops and putting the right units in the right places at the right time to put them in the best possible position to succeed. And you have plenty of options at your disposal to work with. What's kind of cool here is that the characters make their attacks in semi-real time, meaning multiple characters can act at the same time, so you really have to stay on your toes. If you dig games like Final Fantasy Tactics, or any other Ogre Battle game for that matter, then you'll love Person of Lordly Caliber. Here's a surprising one for the PC Engine, known in the US of course as the TurboGrafx-16. It's a port of Street Fighter II Champion Edition, and it's really well done. In fact, I'd say it's definitely better than the Super Nintendo port of Street Fighter II The World Warrior. Since this is Champion Edition, you can play as all four bosses, and all the bonus stages are here for what it's worth. The game plays surprisingly really well. I was able to execute special moves with ease, and the action was really smooth. Yeah, the sound here isn't the greatest, and you have to press a button to switch from punch to kick, but I wouldn't call that a deal breaker. I just wanted to point this one out for anyone that digs the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics. This port did stay in Japan, so you gotta play this one any way you can. In part 1 I talked about Sid Meier's Pirate's Gold, a PC port to the Sega Genesis, and it's quickly become one of my favorite games since I started this channel. So I thought I'd do my due diligence and also mention that this game also made its way to the NES? Yeah, that's right, it's an 8-bit open world game developed by Rare, and it's really well done. It is pretty limited, and I mean it kinda has to be, but the nuts and bolts of a great game are all here. The open world exploring, the character customization, different time periods to choose from, plundering other ships and entire towns. It's a great time, and it's really easy to sink tons and tons of hours into this one, so if you're into NES collecting, or just NES games in general, definitely check this one out, it's well worth it. Sticking with real-time strategy games, here's one on Game Boy Color, surprisingly, named Warlocked, and it's got all the stuff you'd expect from a traditional real-time strategy game. There's resource management, where you assign tasks to characters, whether it's gathering wood or gold. You build stuff, there's a hero system, there's even a fog of war mechanic here, meaning you can only see parts of the map that you uncover by exploring. There's only two different races you can play as, and only three different environments, but there's tons of character types you can obtain, everything from wizards, which can produce all sorts of different spells, from sleeping spells to spreading a friggin' plague. There's necromancers, dragons, elves. I can't believe they crammed all this onto a Game Boy cartridge. It's not a perfect game, but it is surprisingly really well made, and it's worth a look if you dig strategy games. Let's move on to the Sega Master System, and here's one of the best looking games I've ever seen for that platform. It's the Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck. It's kind of like the 8-bit counterpart to Quackshot on Sega Genesis, and you travel the world looking for Magicka Dispel, who's stolen Scrooge McDuck's Lucky Dime and kidnapped Huey, Dewey, and Louie in the process. This one was developed by Sega themselves, and it also has a Game Gear edition, but I mean, just look at the sprite animation here. It almost perfectly represents the Disney source material, and the game controls really smoothly while throwing in some inventive level design. This is a fantastic game, one of the very best on the Master System that I've found, and it also has a sequel titled Deep Duck Trouble that's a worthy follow-up, so if you're into Disney games but somehow haven't been able to play these two, you gotta try them out for yourself. Here's a game that was first developed for the Sharp X68000 computer back in 1994 called Mad Stalker Full Metal 4th. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up and it's strictly 2D action here, reminiscent of something like Ninja Warriors. 
you like giant mech suits punching stuff till it goes boom, well then this is your kind of game. It's fast paced and you can execute Street Fighter style commands to do all sorts of special moves. Plus there's a dash, double jump, grappling moves. It's a classic case of a game where your character is way overpowered and you just smash everything in your way. It's really fun. This game did get a re-release on PlayStation titled Mad Stalker Full Force in 1997, so that would be the most common way to play this one today, but I just get a kick out of highlighting these old computer systems, just in the hopes that they won't be forgotten. Also, the original music really sounds awesome. Back in the mid to late 90s, my family was lucky enough to have a Compact 486, so I spent a lot of time playing Doom Engine and Build Engine games, everything from Duke Nukem 3D to Blood to Heretech to Hexen. But here's a Doom Engine game I had never even seen before called Strife. It's one of the last commercially released PC games to use the Doom Engine, and holy crap this game is impressive considering when it was made. It's a story-driven first-person shooter with RPG elements, and there is a lot going on here. Way more than I can sum up in just one paragraph. The weapons here are awesome, and the dungeon design is fantastic, featuring a lot more than just the usual find a key and unlock an area type thing. If you dig games like this, you will not be disappointed in Strife. There is a remake available on Steam, listed as the original Strife Veteran Edition, which is an upgraded version of the game featuring a few convenient modern addendums. The Panasonic 3DO didn't get too many standout games, but there's one that's kind of interesting that I should mention called Lucienne's Quest, and it's the only JRPG in the 3DO library. You play as Lucienne who has to watch over this tower while her boss is away before this werewolf dude shows up searching for a cure for his condition. So Lucienne, for some reason, says, hey, what the heck, let's look for a cure, and on their journey they do the cliched JRPG stuff of helping out random strangers in towns and all that stuff. Okay, this isn't the most original game ever, the combat is also the usual turn-based thing, but I just thought I'd point this game out because it may scratch that JRPG itch for some people. It's not the best game, but it's something fans of JRPGs may not have found out about otherwise, so I had to give it a spot in this video. Finally, I wanted to share a game I read about in a book titled Replay, The History of Video Games, written by Tristan Donovan. And what's great about that book in particular is that it's not dominated by American and Japanese gaming. It also touches on the European gaming scene throughout the 80s, and what I found really interesting in particular is how many different countries or regions put their own cultural spin when it came to developing games. For instance, the French weren't satisfied with simple arcade-style gaming. Developers like Froggy Software created text adventure games that touched on serious subjects like drug addiction and mental illness. Illness. They really made a point to differentiate themselves from American, Japanese, and British gaming. And let me tell you, nothing could be more different and more out there than Captain Blood. This game was first released in 1988 for the Atari ST, but made its way to tons of other computer systems, and this game is just nuts. You're supposed to track down five of your own alien clones, but to find them, you have to integrate yourself amongst different alien cultures by speaking their respective languages. You do that through this interface of 150 different icons, and each alien race has their own language created specifically for this game from scratch. Oh, and if that wasn't daunting enough, the longer you take to identify a clone, the more your health deteriorates, and when that happens, you have a harder time actually controlling the mouse cursor. It starts to shake and go nuts, and oh my god, this game is crazy. I mean, just look at this. It's some kind of H.R. Geiger-inspired nightmare. But yeah, I just thought it was really interesting how some cultures approached gaming in a completely different way, leading to some truly off-the-wall ideas like what you see in Captain Blood. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.